So as you probably know, <clears throat> this is our time once a month to reflect on the four Brahma Baharas. And what's really amazing, I mean, it's we all kind of know this, but it really matters what we pay attention to and how we pay attention. And the real trick is how do we keep these beautiful qualities in mind. What kind of skillful means, competence, do we have to cultivate to keep these attitudes in mind? In a way, it's, it's our most important karmic act. You know, we might think, you know, did I, was I kind to the checkout person or you know, did I greet my partner this morning? Did I, was I friendly to the cat? But more impactful is all these moment to moment decisions the mind is making in terms of what we pay attention to. And um, the thing is, we just feel, it just feels so justifiable to pay attention to what makes us angry <laughs> and what makes us upset and what makes us feel proud and what makes us, but we can also notice and train ourselves to notice what, or pay attention to what evokes kindness. And it's not like we need a different experience, like within any moment of experience, it really matters like, is my intention to relate to this moment in a way that arouses the attitude of kindness and goodness. And we don't realize it's like, we just presume that it's the world that's making me irritable and angry and fearful. And, and it's, it's so humili humiliating to realize, actually it's the way I'm relating, what I'm paying attention to, how I'm paying attention that's what's making me anxious, irritable, aversive, whatever. No, I'm not, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody with any wisdom would say it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Of course it matters. But it's just a question if we're going to cultivate a sense of being the victim of experience, or we're going to cultivate this perception that I can take care of my heart and mind. I can notice what I'm paying attention to, how I'm paying attention. I can learn so that over time, I'm more and more abiding in states of goodness, kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, these four Brahma Viharas. So that's enough to kind of get us started. I'll give some instructions. We'll practice for about 35 minutes, maybe a little longer. And then we'll have a good half an hour just to check in and people can ask some questions or just share from your own practice. <clears throat> so let's all do what we need to do to feel comfortable. It can be helpful not to... Uh, have to deal with a lot of painful sensations in our body. So whatever we can do to feel <clears throat> stable in our sitting posture. Maybe take a couple of longer, deeper breaths in and out. Just as a way of coming home feeling like we belong in this moment, in this body, <clears throat> feeling that we can actually feel safe, feeling what we feel now in the heart, not needing a different experience of body, heart, mind.
And even the simple willingness to land right in the middle and to feel at home to whatever degree and to be willing to feel what we're feeling. Even this is very definitely an act of goodness. It's good to be willing to feel what I'm feeling now. So can we recognize, however ordinary it might seem, <clears throat> let's do our best to recognize that right now, it's really good that I'm interested in connecting with my experience as it already is unfiltered, I'm willing to feel what's being felt here. I'm not going to blame or complain. Instead, I'll do this kind, simple kind act of just feeling being with my experience because I care about this life, this moment. I care enough to let the moment in, to connect and sustain. So our first step in our practice is one way or another <clears throat> to arouse metta, this goodness of the heart. And we might do that arousing by, as we've been doing these last few moments, realizing that I can include my experience, I can get close. And in this way, I can have a friendly and generous relationship with the felt sense of my body and my heart, quality of my mind. But there are many ways for us to arouse confidently arouse the goodness of the heart. And we can bring to mind a loved one, somebody easy to love, even a pet, of course. And just realize, oh yeah, this heart is actually capable <clears throat> of very sincere, authentic, Goodness, here it is. I feel it, I see it. And our natural relationship with this being we brought to mind is may you be well, may you be safe, may you be at ease. That's uncontrived, it's unforced. It's just a natural movement of love. So that's another way to arouse metta bringing somebody easy to love, some being that's easy to love to mind. And just feel, notice the heart responding in that loving, generous way. And then really pay attention to that goodness and let it reestablish confidence that this heart is capable of being really good generous and kind and well-wishing. This is real. I'm not forcing this or making it happen. So this is the first step. It's really creative work. How can we remember this heart's capacity to be good in this moment, not theoretically, but right now. A 
And then just keeping that goodness in mind in whatever way, whatever supports you need. So it isn't the phrase or the memory of hugging your puppy or your cat or whatever. It's the experience of love itself that we're keeping in mind, the attitude of kindness. And the memory and the phrase or the felt sense of the body that we're willing to be close with. These are just skillful means for arousing this generosity of the heart. So just keep at it in a creative, relaxed, sweet way. Keeping the goodness of the heart in mind and arousing it in any way that works. And the telltale sign is the sense of inner confidence. This heart is good. And we feel and know it in a direct way. We sense it directly. This is the awareness of the attitude of metta, goodness. And as we keep it in mind, keep it in mind, keep it in mind, learn how to sustain this attention, this interest in the goodness of the heart. And we'll just naturally start to be interested to discern its generous quality, its well-wishing. And it has this energetic upwelling or this quality of expansiveness, this upwelling of the heart. So just keep that in mind, do what you can, what you need to, to arouse metta, keep it in mind. And as you keep it in mind, notice the upwelling quality. And this is pleasant. It's like the expansiveness of goodness, the generosity, and it might express itself as a wish. May you be at ease. May your heart be happy and at ease. Something is welling up and spilling over as we relate to our own life, as we relate to others, as we relate to the body, this moment. In the same way that a smile <clears throat> is generous, a real smile isn't just for some. It goes out everywhere because the happiness is inside and it wants to expand. And this is that upwelling of metta. It's a natural giving away the goodness, spreading it out. Including other friends, other loved ones, all aspects of our life or personality, all aspects of the body, all aspects of this moment. And so we're doing our best to keep in mind the generous quality of metta, loving kindness.
And as the practice develops in moments, confidence in the heart's goodness deepens. Then the third skill we're learning is to sense the boundlessness of the loving kindness, the goodness of the heart. Like a radiant, beautiful light, its generosity is all inclusive, doesn't hold back, doesn't pick and choose. It's a beautiful warmth, a beautiful light that happily goes out in all directions, really doesn't have limits. In a sense, it colors the mind and the heart. So whatever is known feels included in the radiance of kindness, of goodness and love. So we arouse metta when we need to. We notice the upwelling, the generosity of it. And as it matures, we notice its boundlessness, its inclusivity. Nothing's left out. So when you can notice that boundless radiance of love, And the final step is to trust the love, the goodness enough that you no longer feel you have to be the person doing it or practicing it. So instead we just abide or even rest in the radiant boundless love. It's like we become the love that goes out everywhere, everybody, everything included. So just cycle through these four skills as they're needed. The skill of arousing goodness, sensing its generosity, its upwelling, sensing the boundlessness, Sensing that it doesn't need a doer, somebody practicing it. We can just abide or be love. Very beautiful, restful. Embrace. So let's continue in silence for a while, just doing the best we can.
and remember it really matters what we choose to pay attention to, what we bring to mind, what we keep bringing to mind. And this really goes to the heart of what we're doing with the divine abodes. We're specifically bringing to mind experience that arouses this goodness of the heart, bringing to mind that experience of upwelling, that natural generosity of goodness, expansiveness, bringing to mind the experience of boundless goodness, nothing remains untouched. And we're bringing to mind, keeping in mind the sense of not doing it, but just being the love or abiding, resting in this beautiful radiance of goodness. Even if it feels quite subtle, it's okay.
we need to be <clears throat> willing to begin again and again. Keep it really simple. We're learning how to keep goodness in mind. Sometimes we need to do the more involved work of arousing it. Sometimes it's quite well established and it's more about trusting and abiding and relaxing in the radiance of goodness. In one way or the other, we're keeping it in mind. We're remembering it, not forgetting it and ultimately being the goodness. And we're not trying to make the experience special. We're always coming back to this very simple truth that this heart is capable of expressing goodness. And so with that confidence, we just begin keeping that goodness in mind, feeling its expansive nature boundless nature, and really it's impersonal nature, and really trusting that's here and now, it's not contrived, it's here and now, directly being felt, being known. Just be appreciative, grateful for the goodness of the heart.
We'll continue for a little longer. So if you sense that there's some aspect of your experience of your life that for whatever reason can't be included in this beautiful goodness, this expansive goodness, this generosity of the heart, just challenge that a little bit. I care about those closed off places, or I care about that simmering anger and feelings of betrayal that I have. You might find a way for that goodness to include even those places that might feel hot or tight or whatever. Maybe love knows how to include even those places that seem like they're just in the opposite direction. If nothing else, love knows how to care about the hotness or the weight, weightfulness, the tightness. I care about all that pain care enough to be close and patient and forgiving, care enough to even have a sense of humor about how much suffering this heart is experienced, is experiencing. Seems so real, the suffering. And I care about all of that. Care enough to stay open and humble, knowing that I don't know everything. But I care. And I feel the goodness of that caring. Even if I don't know how to take care of my life, myself, or others, I still can care and wish well. And just learning how to include the whole catastrophe of our lives together. It's so unfathomable how much joy and how much suffering and injustice there is. This really helps us understand why equanimity is really the foundation of all of these qualities of love. Equanimity, of course, always involves a lot of humility. We don't pretend to know or that we need to know. We just know that we care. We just know that I'm tired of not being connected, not feeling what's here to feel, not being open to what's moving, in my heart, in my world. So for the last couple of minutes, just that boundless, boundlessness of equanimity or balance, may we all be at ease in this changing, undefinable world we live in, ungovernable world we live in. Maybe abide with ease and balance, kindness. Maybe there's a wisdom and love here in the heart that can include all of the bad, all the injustice, all the uncertainty, as well as all the beauty and goodness. 
this wise, loving heart that doesn't have a problem that the world is the way that it is, that my personality, my body is the way that it is, that others are the way that they are. Can hold it all with wisdom and love. I will abide pervading all quarters with this heart imbued with love above and below, all around, everywhere, in every way. I will abide pervading the all encompassing world with love, goodness understanding and patience, equanimity and balance, I will abide. Abundant, exalted, boundless, not afraid. Free from all ill will, free from all fear, I will abide. And really see this as a gift that we give ourselves, we give others, we give the world. I will abide in this goodness. I will do my best to keep it in mind. And when you feel ready, just allowing the eyes to open if they've been closed. Just your body if you need to. So if there's anybody <clears throat> new tonight, this is just one way, of course, of doing the practice. And it really just involves these four skills that we can be working on all day long, you know, given all the triggers, different attitudes, different ways of relating are going to arise in our mind and our heart. But we can always like be curious, well, might I be able in this moment, like might this moment as it actually is, the circumstances as they are, might it be fertile ground for the arising the arousal of kindness, goodness. Might there be something in my field of experience that could be used, you know, how I relate to it, what I'm paying attention to. I could relate to it in a way that would bring out this capacity for goodness. Could I notice that generous, expansive quality of that goodness? It's boundlessness. Could I really rest trusted enough to really abide in a restful way, trusting way? Kind of in a way we give ourselves. So instead of having a plan, you know, a lot of times when we're living our life, we're trying to figure out like, what should I say? What should I do? And, you know, it's feels very appropriate to kind of take the steering wheel, so to speak, and drive our way through life, you know, to avoid accidents. And But what we're doing when we arouse and get confident of this wisdom, this wisdom and love, this capacity to be wise and loving, then we're really the work, you know, from a personality practitioner point of view, the work is to trust the wisdom and love and just see how it handles everything. So instead of handling all the twists and turns of the day and this interaction and that thing I got to do, and we're more interested in arousing and maintaining states of love and wisdom, that kind of curiosity and humility and discernment 
and sensitivity of love. And just trust that we'll figure out what to say and what to do and you know what to put down and what to pick up. And it's sort of, uh, we want to be free. You know, we, we all aspire. It all, always makes sense to us that, oh yeah, I like this idea of liberation, freedom, not feeling the weight of the world on my shoulders. That sounds really good. But yet we really don't trust not being in the driver's seat. No, 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 I can't trust. Well, how are we going to be free, you know, if we feel like there's somebody like me who's in danger of making a mistake, who has to do it right? So we have to practice being free. How do we do that? Well, we arouse metta, love, and we arouse wisdom. We keep arousing them, we keep bringing them into mind, keeping them in mind, sensing their, how functional these qualities of mind are, wisdom and love. And we set them up, we set them in motion. They, you know, with practice, they can dominate the mind, the personality. And then, and then in the sense of Mark, the practitioner, can let go for a while when they're strong. Just let the force, the momentum of love and wisdom do what it does. So in a way, we're watching wisdom and love at work. It's not personal. Like That's part of that fourth skill is to, to really see that we can take the hands off the steering wheel. We, have to, we don't have to keep pedaling <laughs> to keep the metta, the loving kindness, and the wisdom going. Mindfulness, wisdom, loving kindness, and moments can have enough momentum that we can just let everything happen on its own. Then we get, we start to get a taste of what freedom, the freedom the Buddha was pointing to. Yeah, I know. And I think that could go a long way to healing some of the divisiveness if we all, and you know, all 300 and whatever million of us in this country at least, you know, if we just decided for two weeks, we were only going to pay attention to what is good. <laughs> and it's not like we're going to stop dealing with what's off, but we're going to realize it isn't the whole truth. And because, uh, you know, this is the thing we, things have been divisive, but we, then we get in that mode of just noticing what's divisive and not kind of the harmony how about if we just started noticing all the little and big ways we're harmonizing with each other? Like a lot of the times on the roads, people are harmonizing together, following the rules mostly, you know, taking turns. But we never, pre we only notice the, the jerk who's whatever, cutting us off or whatever. That gets our attention. But we don't notice like how many people are kind of really taking care of each other on the highways and interstates and whatever. Yeah. And, and how great it is that people are, I'm like, that's the other thing I really appreciate people getting involved and uh, whoever they are, you know, it's just like, a, oh, the right people should get involved, you know, not the bad people or whatever in this divisive mode, but just some confidence that if we, if we get involved and we have a conversation, things might actually change if we learn to listen to each other. Yeah, thanks for getting us started. Other thoughts or questions that have emerged people want to bring up? What are we, I mean, it's this Friday session is really our responsibility to check in with each other. What are we learning about love? Like, is love something fluffy? that doesn't really have any substance just you know for fools or is it a a functional powerfully functional aspect capacity of our heart that can be either cultivated or ignored and and buddhist thinking you know it's really a power house that mostly gets ignored because you know, we, we've lost confidence how functional, useful it is, transforming. Yeah, and that, that curiosity, that, that's related to that second skill of the upwelling 
like that quality of goodness, it wants to get bigger. So instead of like, oh, I'm trying to make my love bigger or my kindness greater or my compassion mm -hmm. deeper, it's more that we're noticing that in the nature of compassion is for it to be more inclusive, to go where it hasn't gone. Oh, I can care about that too. And of course, there's going to be pushback because the conditioned mind is going to be afraid of that kind of love or that kind of compassion, like, oh, what about me? You know? So it's a, uh, it, it's really, it gets our attention, doesn't it? I mean, and uh, nobody starts out kind of healed. And I don't think people actually end up healed, really. We're just, we, the love contains the brokenness as opposed to somebody becomes this perfect, radiant light of love. You know, it's more that they, uh, they learn to be unafraid because, you know, that's such a powerful image of, uh, about the um, blanket with a few holes. You know, that just seems because that that might be really impactful for you, what that image means and what it represents. And, you know, like maybe there's a way to hold that and, and no longer demand that it be better or different than it is, because we are the legacy of our of our ancestors and our culture and so many things that are so deeply broken. And so I'm not sure all of that is going to get healed in anybody's life, lifetime. Mm, mm, mm. But I'm pretty sure that in moments, at least, we can be relating, knowing, feeling, being with that in really profound, profoundly beautiful ways. I still sometimes, but I used to much more my, my relationship with Wynn, my spouse, um, you know, we've been married, we've been together since 1991 and married for 29 of those years. Um, and because uh, I'm, I'm kind of an odd fish and, and you know, maybe we all are odd fishes, but I'm talking about my odd fish now. And uh, just the sense of like, I'm not this kind of... Uh, you know, adoring partner. <laughs> it's not, it's not my nature to like pour on this adoration toward win yeah. and, uh, or anybody, including myself, of course. <laughs> and, uh, but I really like, and, you know, and there's some of, maybe there's a thread of that is wisdom and there's, and the bulk of it is probably just, you know, unhealthy causes and effects from the legacy of my upbringing and culture and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then I'm a person like this. And then when I'm in a intimate relationship, it looks like this. And, uh, but I'm much more okay about being who I am. I'm much more mm -hmm. loving about mm -hmm. being an imperfect lover. Mm -hmm. And that somehow makes the whole thing more workable <laughs> as opposed to like i've gotten perfect at this thing of you know being a partner and of course that's exactly how our, that because it's it's the way our mind conceives of th things you know we hear about metta loving kindness and then we this is the this is really the essence of suffering is the mind the thinking mind let's say it it uses opposites so it's like i'm here and I construct this idea yeah. of Mark with a lot of love. And then this isn't it, it's, this is it. Yeah. And uh, then we just have another way to beat ourselves up or to compare, to develop conceit of being good or not good or the same as, or whatever position that we imagine. As opposed to a more immediate, direct, like, this heart is capable of connecting and caring of not, it's really the absence of aversion, the absence of being afraid of who we are, mm. you know, a big wet 
I like oh, Saida Upandita, one of the well-known Burmese teachers. He's dead now, but who taught many of the Western teachers. And he, he had the image of an old horse blanket, <laughs> mildewy and, you know, covering our heart. And uh, you're, you're, you're fortunate because you have a few holes in yours. <laughs> but, uh, but to somehow uh, not be afraid of seeing that truth of mm-hmm. the brokenness of our heart and mind. It's like we, we, we have to understand that the whole news business these days is driven, of course, by us spending time reading or watching. And they've learned because they've really studied what gets our attention that a provoking fear and anger uh, gets people to watch more and uh, not stories about goodness. <laughs> so we have to understand that because once we turn the news on, whether it's in the written form or video form, we'll be pulled in. And I'm not saying we should cut ourselves off completely, but we need to be really thoughtful and strategic, just like when we do meditative training, it's like we're going against the grain. And this is the, another place where we have to go against the grain is there are a lot of ways to fill up the day that just support that habit, that deep instinct, that a survival mechanism is to see the danger, whether real or imagined. And, um, we may survive, but we'll be totally stressed out and unhappy, right? But in with the information age, there's no end to the danger that we can see and imagine because it's being constructed by media sources that get paid by captivating us, spellbound by danger and you know, this. And of course, more second to you know, pulling us in with fear and hate is greed. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like, I, and I, I don't think this is easy. It's not easy for me, but, uh, you know, just to, if we're going to get involved with media, just to be interested in the question, what kind of mind, what kind of heart is getting set in motion? And is that the kind of mind and heart that uh, the world needs, that I need? because it might lead to different choices. But I'm not saying this is easy. I don't think, I don't find it easy for myself. That's why I became a Buddhist teacher because it gives me, I, I'm forced to sort of put things down when i on retreat or teaching a retreat or at least to some degree. Yeah, it sounds a lot like, you know, that what I was saying about that fourth skill of abiding in goodness. Mm. And just letting everything else happen on its own. Your story might inspire a few others. We have a little bit more time because these uh, these experiences actually teach us about the freedom the Buddha points to. Because it's it's so abstract to think of nibbana or awakening. Like, what does that mean? But you know, in that the experience that Anne just shared, you know, we get a sense that able to act very functionally in those moments. And her heart was probably to some large degree unburdened in the way you described your experience. So unburdened yet really functional, right? And, the, and the <clears throat> unburdened with even the desire to be good or to do it like that even, that burden fell away, we could tell from how you <clears throat> shared. And so th- that gives us a real sense like, uh, the goodness and the functionality, like just being skillful in, in the moment, it's just, it's nature, wisdom and love doing its own work, not Mark or Anne or somebody doing it. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean there aren't times like the, when we're arousing it, when our mind is mostly negative or fearful and we have the thought, oh, I should, it matters what I pay attention to, I should skillfully pay attention to you know what when i pay attention to it will arouse 
this capacity for kindness and, and love. So that takes a different kind of effort. But the conditions were just right that then we really want to drop the sense of I need to do this right and just let it all happen. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that, you know, it's like, oh, we should really like that feeling of being pleased because we did something that felt impactful. It's like to really take the time and to consciously know I'm feeling pleased, you know, because that's a good, and to kind of really let it in that, like, I had this intention to want to be useful and helpful. I couldn't go, but I sent flowers that it really mattered to them. And my heart feels pleased. It's kind of the heart is rejoicing in its goodness. And, you know, th this is the nice thing about Buddhism. It kind of, it kind of deconstructs. It's like, oh, yeah, that's good. That is good. And, and that makes it easier to notice. So when we restrain ourselves from doing something that wouldn't be good, we want to feel good about that too. Like I could have said that, but I didn't. And that feels good. Or I could have sent flowers and I did, and it was impactful and it feels good. And I, I'm gonna really pay attention to that. It feels good. Yeah. Because we, you know, we've been mostly talking about metta tonight, uh, the, the, the basic goodness, but then there's karuna or compassion, which is its own kind of thing. And because it is a beautiful quality of the heart, compassion, that it involves letting something move that's generally painful. But it's beautiful, the movement, the non fear, the non contraction around the pain is beautiful, but that means pain's moving, but that's healing, isn't it? And that's probably what you experienced, that there's some healing and it's probably modeling energetically, subtly modeling for all the kids, yeah. what they have to do with their own pain. Yeah. Whether it's self-compassion or compassion for others, yeah. it's being in the vicinity of where there's brokenness and suffering and unacknowledged, unresolved pain. It's being in the vicinity of suffering and not being afraid of it, which means it's going to move because no one's locking it down. Really good to be with everybody. Wishing you all well.